Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode five of the Salmon Trout Steel Lighter Podcast, and I'm so happy to have Frank Amato here. How are you doing, Frank? Great. This podcast being brought to you by Salmon Trout Steelheader. This is based off of the work that Frank has been doing here since 1967 when you published your first magazine. Right. Uh -huh. Salmon Trout Steelheader. And uh, I wanted to get straight into some subjects that I find interesting, and I believe you do too. Basically about steelhead movement. So I had just kind of a question about um, steelhead moving up rivers in particulars that have falls. And how, how do you think steelhead re react to a good moderate to large size fall that they can still ascend? You know, say something like Willamette Falls or something. How, how would they react to that in, say, a really high water? Well, I can't really give you exactly explicit knowledge about this, but in following Willamette Falls on the Willamette River, that's the falls where they have kept actually daily track of both summer and winter steelhead passage throughout the entire year for about, I think, probably 60 or 70 years now. And they keep the temperature daily, they keep the river's turbidity, and they keep track of the river velocity. When the Willamette is running from about 10,000 cubic feet per second up to about 50,000 cubic feet per second, and the water is not colder than about 42, 40, 41, 42, 43 degrees, the fish seem to pass over the falls pretty much regularly. They don't wait, but if there is a high water above 60 or 70,000 cubic feet per second after a good rainstorm in the winter, or if there is cold water below 40 degrees, again in the winter, the fish will go from maybe 100 per day migrating over the falls down to one or two or none. So there's a real difference in the way temperature affects the migration of steelhead and also the way the velocity of the water, whether it's a falls or whether it's a dam or whether it's just a free-flowing free river with uh, rapids and pools. And so being that they're holding below the falls, you know, you could essentially be looking for them in more comfortable places to hide not far below it? Yeah, the, the higher the water flow in the center of the river gets, it seems like the further or the closer to shore the fish will get because the velocity of the water will be less. And if you have high flood water almost, uh, the, the, the fish will get as close to like a foot or two off the bank in very, very dirty water. And uh, if it's a small stream that has a lot of fish in it, like the Wilson or the Trask, uh, it, you know, it becomes practical to be a, uh, not a bobber fisherman, but a plunker. But if the water is low and clear, they're going to be further out, they're going to be in deeper water, and uh, you're going to have to use different techniques to approach them. And the colder the water, it, that also has an effect on the way they take. And the colder the water, really the softer they take. The warmer the water up to the point where you have summer temperature and you're using a wobbler in a summer steelhead stream, the, the, the take can be virtually explosive with the fish maybe even running across the stream excitedly and beaching himself on the other side, the opposite side of the bank, which has happened to me, really? both fly fishing or gear fishing. Wow. So in that, uh, what about now if the temperature is getting into the deep of summer, um, is that going to put them more... And, and in the case of summer steelhead, which would be, of course, in the rivers through the summer and into the fall mm -hmm. and even the early, early winter, the summer steelhead have a tendency in, in many streams, the majority of streams, to come in the months of June, July, and uh, August. And the longer they're in the stream and the lower the water gets and the warmer the water gets, the more reticent they are towards taking taking. I used to fish the Washougal a lot when it was first in, when summer steelhead were first introduced to it in the 60s 
and I was fly fishing, and uh, if the water was low and clear, which it was in June, July, and August, and particularly if it was warm, the fish would not respond very well to a fly. But if you put a wobbler through the same place, or a little fly rod wobbler, bang, the fish would, that would turn on and mm. a certain aggressiveness and they would take. But uh, the fish are very uh, choosy in different water conditions. And fish that become really dry, summer seal had to become what we would call uh, almost lethargic. Mm -hmm. uh, as soon as you get that first rain in, say, maybe the middle of August or in September or October, and these are summer steelhead that have been waiting to spawn for three months to six months, that fresh water, it doesn't take much, only a couple of inches rise in the river and a little bit of a temperature difference, and you can go from having a one-day fish the previous day to having a 15-day fish the next day. I've experienced this many times on rivers like the Winds and the Deschutes and uh, Washougal, Kalama, and many others. But these were for summer steelhead in uh, specific, you know, s certain situations. Interesting. So now you mentioned when you, you mentioned when steelhead, summer steelhead, were introduced, but. The Washougal did have a, a wild run before that, and that was right about the time of the yeah, I, stocking. There was a wonderful book that I learned about steelhead in, and not a book I published, but it was a book that uh, a, uh, what was his name, called Northwest Angling mm -hmm. by Enos Bradner. Enos Bradner wrote the book probably in the early 50s. I asked my mother if she would get it for me for Christmas. I was in grade school at that mm -hmm. time or maybe high school, and uh, in it he explained the differences between the summer steelhead and the winter steelhead, and he fished rivers like the Wind, the Kalama, and southwest Washington rivers on up to the uh, some of the tributaries of the uh, Skagit and also the, the Green River up by Seattle. but. He spoke a lot in there about water temperature differences, and that kind of gave me my first kind of introduction to the fact that steelhead were unlike many other fish in that the water is always changing in small streams, the temperature is always changing, much more so than in a lake where you have mm -hmm. fixed water, fixed water velocity, none virtually. And uh, steelhead, though, react to all of these things. so. You need to really get hold of some good books or good articles and uh, to, to learn about the steelhead's habits and uh, how water and uh, velocity of the water and the water temperature affects them. For sure. What, uh, among your published books that you've done, I know one in particular that I learned a lot about steelhead migration was the Wild Steelhead book by J.D. Was it McPhail or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doctor McPhail, yes, a, a Canadian, uh, a Canadian fisheries biologist. Yes, he he goes into length the biologic uh, circumstances or or, or uh, how biology affects steelhead. Yeah, for sure, and that one's available at amatobooks.com. A M A T O books.com along with many others. Yes. And, uh, it's a wonderful book. He started fishing as a youngster in Vancouver, British Columbia on some of the local uh, Vancouver city streams or, or area streams and uh, ride, rode his bike to the stream and kind of came up the uh, hard way and it's a fantastic book for that reason too. Yeah, I enjoyed it for sure. Um, now, one of the, uh, one of the questions um, that interests me is kind of there there are a lot of different areas that steelhead have unique runs run timings and even the size of the fish so mm -hmm. it, just along the pacific rim what kind of differences do you see from the southern reaches of steelhead to the northern reaches well it's interesting because if you go in california all the way south to the ventura river down around los angeles uh, the steelhead there seem to have come in in uh, the latter part of summer and into uh, fall and a little bit into winter 
and the fish were actually quite large. I think they got up to like even 10 pounds. And as you went north in California, rivers like the Eel and the Feather and uh, Sacramento, uh, uh, even up to uh, the Klamath, all had good runs of what we would call, I suppose, winter steelhead that would come in oftentimes in the fall. Some of these fish wouldn't come in because there was a sandbar blocking the entrance to the river. So on some of these streams, the fishermen and the fish would have to wait till there was a big rain and it would blow open the sandbar and the fish could go up the stream then. I, I can't think of any of the names of those rivers, but Matiol might have been one of them. But anyway, uh, and those, those fish mainly were from like four or five pounds and up to again like eight or ten. But then you got to a river called the Klamath, which as a river at one time drained all the way up to Klamath Falls then into southeast Oregon. And it had, and still has, the Klamath, the Klamath River, a strong run of uh, half-pounders. Mm -hmm. And by half-pounders is meant small steelhead from immature steelhead some mature, but from 12 inches on up to maybe 22 inches. And, uh, but at the same time, the Klamath also had a run of uh, bigger steelhead. The bigger steelhead would come in later in the year and through the winter time, through February and March. But the half-pounders would come in as, as early, depending on rain. If there was rain in August, they would start entering the Klamath. But if there was no rain, they might not come in until September and October, even though there was still plenty of water, but they just liked uh, a freshening of the water before they would come in, it, uh, maybe 100,000, maybe 500,000 of them. They were huge runs of small fish. Wow. And that situation continued in the, the sh in, in the Rogue River in southern Oregon. The ones you got north of the Rogue River all the way to Alaska, there were no more runs of half-pounders, the small steelhead. Uh, occasionally, we catch a small steelhead in the wintertime that might be 15 inches or 18 inches long, and they do mature and they do spawn, particularly the males. Hmm. They're rare, rare, but you catch yeah. them occasionally. So large runs of the smaller fish and those, now with their migration patterns, they may not have been using the same sections of the ocean or do you think it was more related to just a genetic well, it, timer? It's hard to say. I, I yeah. don't know. The scientists have probably determined whether those smaller fish, I think most of the feeling is that they migrated out to the ocean but because they didn't spend two years like the normal steelhead, they would spend maybe only uh, six, six months, eight months, ten months. They'd go out in the spring as smolts and then come back six months later as uh, what we would call half-pounders. Yeah. These fish had a high percentage of repeat spawning. The females could spawn and then go back out, whereas the the more traditional steelhead, the, the six, eight, six to eight to twenty pound steelhead, they only spawn, uh, you know, for generally only spawn once, and yeah. some hardy females maybe spawn a second time. Um, those smaller half-pound Fish, would that be kind of more related to a anadromous cutthroat life cycle, would you say? Yeah, I think so, especially considering that, you know, they didn't migrate that long yeah. five to ten thousand mile journey that a that a, a full two year ocean steelhead travels. Right. So when the smolts leave the Columbia or Oregon or Washington, they travel north and then they travel up towards the Gulf of Alaska and then head out towards the uh, central uh, ocean and then go south through warmer water eating shrimp and then they come in they make this huge like 10,000 mile circuit over two year period of time but the half pounders probably didn't wander more than maybe 20 to 100 or 200 miles from their stream mouth incredibly interesting species of fish well, that's that's yeah, that's what's so interesting about it, and and we used to always think that there was a that this rainbow trout 
was, yes, yeah, certainly a relative of the steelhead, but it was kind of a totally separate, you know, species. But uh, actually now we find that for years and years, the wild rainbow trout that we have in the Pacific coastal uh, streams, they are indeed uh, essentially steelhead that never go to the ocean. And uh, they spawn with adult steelhead, particularly the, the, uh, the male resident trout, big enough male resident trout, will, will attempt, <coughs> attempt to spawn with the uh, ocean female steelhead. Quite a disparity in size, a two pound fish spawning with one that might be anywhere from 10 to 20 pounds. But it's a way uh, that Mother Nature has created of ensuring that we always have steelhead, assuming that, you know, the weather doesn't get too warm to uh, change it. Fishing styles between the southern and northern fisheries of steelhead along the Pacific Rim, would you say that there's much difference, or is it more related to the specific temperature and uh, river level of the time? Well, it, it, it's, that's the thing that makes steelhead fishing and fishing so interesting, and that's that there's so many different techniques and baits and flies in approaches in rods and reels and gear that applies to all these mirrored steelhead and each individual fisherman has kind of got to sort out the way he wants to catch the fish and then find out if that's a practical way to do it and some people become so sporting for catching for fishing for steelhead that they'll only use a fly that a surface fly that doesn't have a hook on it. They're satisfied just to see a fish boil behind their fly and uh, just have the satisfaction to know that they tricked a wild beast. Whereas the guy fishing right next to him might have a gob of a salmon roe on and uh, not just want to see a boil but want to see that fish cooking in a, in a pan in his home. So. And, and you have everything in between. The idea of steelhead is uh, it's a, it's a glorious object to be admired and uh, caught and released, or if it's hatchery, caught and if you want, killed and eaten. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, now uh, for you particularly, if you were to choose two methods for steelhead to fish strictly, what would they be? Well, I, I, I'm going to have to say three methods. Three methods. Yeah, that, Fair that I, yeah. I love them all. Yep. When I started fishing for steelhead, I was in the sixth grade, and I was fishing alone in uh, December on a small, tiny stream close to my home, and I was using a worm, and probably like a size 12 bait hook, and casting all of like 10 feet. The fish that I cooked was about a five pound steelhead and I was fishing for six inch trout, not knowing that there were steelhead, not even not knowing what a steelhead was. Needless to say, it surprised me more so than it probably surprised the fish. And after a fight of about uh, well, a couple minutes, the fish was gone and so also was my leader and my hook. But drifting bait and fiddling that steelhead, pick up like a night crawler or eggs and just feeling that throb on the line, kind of feels like you have uh, the world in your hands. And it's just fun to feel that, that something live is pulling at the other end. But then as I got older, I decided that uh, I wanted to try different things. And so it led to uh, fishing with wobblers and lures and fishing with uh, wet flies and dry flies and swan flies and all sorts of uh, artificial fishing for them. What I probably enjoy most now is uh, fishing for summer steelhead on a stream that uh, has fish that maybe are from you know 18 inches on up to 15 pounds and swinging the fly for them on a dry line. It's, 
One reason is because it's the easiest steelhead fishing there is. You don't have to fool around with bait. You don't have to fool around with uh, anything. You just you can fish with one arm and just cast out with one one hand, and then smoke a cigar or you know hang on to your wading stick, cast wade puff, cast wade <laughs> puff, and and uh, eventually you're going to hook a steelhead. But uh, if they're not cooperating in cold water, or if the water is off color or high, then I'll put down that fly rod and pick up a casting rod and and uh, cast a wobbler. And, and when you say wobbler, you mean spoon. A spoon, because some, exactly. Because some people now would think of a wobbler as the large oh, the wobblers plug. they put out behind the boats. <laughs> okay. But I like that, you know, the wobbler and... Yeah, I, I would cast a spoon, exactly. Yeah. And I like, you know, like hammered silver and copper is a great spoon color. Mm -hmm. Fish seem to love that one. And uh, but any kind of a, of a steelhead type spoon. And uh, bait wise, I don't do as much now because I really release virtually every steelhead I catch, even most of the hatchery ones. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, uh, I I understand why people enjoy it, but it's nice that at least we're, we've been encouraged to use barbless hooks and to make as little damage as possible to the fish if we intend to release it. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I uh, actually got to see you swing up a couple fish this fall. Oh yeah, that was fun. Yeah, we got a chance to, uh, Lucas and I got a chance to fish for uh, silvers and chum silvers and chum yeah and I, I had one silver on that trip I stepped out of the boat got into the run and must have been my first cast with uh, was it our guide was, was uh, Keith Johnson Keith. Yeah. yeah Keith and uh, Lucas were watching me and the very first cast virtually I think it must have been a mint bright coho just grabbed my 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 fly, I was using I think a floating line, grabbed the, f the weighted fly and immediately felt the pressure and the line was, part of the line was wrapped around the guide and that fish just exploded in the water and uh, and he came lost, towards you. Lost, yeah. He came towards you, which is, I think, what, yeah. he what broke, threw him. Broke the line, and then he came right at yeah. me. <laughs> and, and it was helpless. But that's, yeah, that was uh, the most exciting fish that I've hooked in the last uh, half a year. Yeah, and... Uh, <laughs> Didn't get him, obviously. Long after, or not long after that, the next hole down, I remember I absolutely beat up the hole with twitching jigs and spoons, and then you came through in your first run through with a with the the swung fly you got a really nice chum in there well, and what? then what happened to that chum it, it, something it, else went after him yeah you remember oh that? oh yeah that's right then an otter yes and actually a uh, a river otter grabbed the chum that i was fighting the chum was probably about 200 feet well 100 feet below us mm -hmm. the, and all of a sudden i felt an awful lot of pressure on the line I couldn't work the fish over towards shore anymore, and so I, I kept looking down there, and then all of a sudden I thought I saw what appeared to be an otter, and and uh, by this time Lucas had run down there with the net. Or Keith, and, yeah, Keith. Or Keith did, yeah. and Keith yelled, Frank, Frank, you've got an otter on, and he's, <laughs> he's got hold of your chum salmon. Yeah. So as soon as Keith went to net the fish, and thinking possibly that the otter might go in the net too. Uh, all hell broke loose, the otter let go of the fish, fortunately, and uh, Keith managed to get the chum, which we released. But the chum had a few marks on it. Yeah, that was, that was pretty incredible considering about an hour before <laughs> we saw another otter, where we were talking about otters, okay. and I had asked, Keith or I had asked you if you'd ever seen an otter try, try to take a fish. Yeah, I, I've never had an otter try to take my fish, but yeah. I was trolling for uh, salmon in a coastal stream using a uh, spinner and for ch fall chinook, and all of a sudden the water exploded five feet from my drift boat, and uh, a salmon 
probably about a 15 or 20 pound salmon jumped about three feet in the air and there was an otter hanging on to him. Oh, wow. and, and as we went by, just trolling, uh, I couldn't believe it, and we, but I didn't stop. We just continued trolling and we trolled back up that way about five minutes later, maybe 10 minutes, and here an otter and several other otters, several otters were eating that salmon. They, it actually ended up getting it. Wow. Bright Chinook, probably 15 pounds. And uh, so they, uh, they know what, how to fish <laughs> better than us. <laughs> but not quite as destructively as a sea lion. <laughs> no, no, it's another yeah. program. Oh, for sure. Well, it's been really nice uh, speaking with you today, Frank. We'll have to get yeah. some more podcasts, talk more steelhead and salmon. And, That's uh, great. You, and, yeah, you're still still getting out there. You've been getting some fish already this year. Yeah, I get older and a little slower, but uh, the desire doesn't really leave you. <laughs> Just the ability. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, good fishing. Yes, sir. Thank you, Frank. That's great. All right. Well, thank you guys for uh, listening. And Frank is just the first in a series of great interviews for this podcast in 2020. And I sure appreciate uh, learning from Frank. And that's one thing I notice is, Frank, you're always learning something with fishing. You never, uh, the, the yeah, interest is always there. Yeah. If you're around water, it's always changing and no better place to be. Yeah. <laughs>